ever seen one of those um, like things in a kid's activity book or maybe on a placemat at a restaurant where it says, um, spot the differences? So there's two pictures and they look at first glance to be identical, right? And then you look and you go, oh, um, well, actually, though, after I'm looking, when you see the word spot the differences at the top, then you notice like, oh, this guy's wearing a black hat in this picture and a white hat in this one. But I didn't notice it at first. And then if you look at the bottom, sometimes it'll say, find the 12 differences. And you go, wow, there's 12 differences between these two pictures that look almost the same. And you start counting them and you usually find 11 and go, ah. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. All right. So we're in our series, Way of Wisdom. We're going verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. Last week, we completed Proverbs chapter 1, and today we move on to Proverbs chapter 2. And as I read through Proverbs chapter 2 this week, I noticed there are some similarities between Proverbs chapter 2 and Proverbs chapter 1. Um, not identical, like not quite like spot the differences. It's not like I'll read it and you'll go, I can't tell the difference between Proverbs 2 and 1. It's, it, it, it's obviously a different chapter. But a lot of the ideas in it, a lot of the points that are made, seem to me to be very similar to things that were already said back in Proverbs chapter 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the similarities, but probably especially spend most of our time looking at some of the differences between Proverbs chapter 2 and Proverbs chapter 1. Um, but I guess before we even get into that, let me go ahead and read you our chapter for this morning. So Proverbs 2, I'm going to read the whole thing. It's 22 verses. Proverbs 2, starting in verse 1, says this. My son, if you accept my words... And store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up success for the upright, he is a shield for those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his loyal followers. Then you will understand righteous justice and integrity, every good path. For wisdom will enter your mind and knowledge will delight your heart. Discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you, rescuing you from the way of evil, from the one who says perverse things, from those who abandon the right paths to walk in ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are cro crooked and whose ways are devious. It will rescue you from a forbidden woman, from a stranger with her flattering talk, who abandons the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house sinks down to death and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her, none reach the paths of life. So follow the way of good people and keep to the paths of the righteous, for the upright will inhabit the land and those of integrity will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous uprooted from it. So that's our passage for this morning. And if you were here last week or the last couple of weeks, maybe you noticed that some of the concepts that are in that passage are similar to what we've already covered. Did you notice? I mean, if you look at verse 1, how it starts, it starts off with, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you. And that should sound somewhat familiar because last week, that was the first, that was similar to the very first verse. Last week, when you looked at uh, chapter 1, verse 8, it begins with, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Don't reject your mother's teaching. So this chapter, like last week's chapter, is kind of um, like put into the form of a father's advice to his son. Uh, you also see that uh, wisdom brings safety. If you look at verse 11 of this chapter, it says, discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. And there's you know, passages like that in this chapter, which reminds me of the last chapter. Remember in chapter 1, verse 33, it says, whoever listens to me, this is wisdom talking, will live securely and be free from the fear of danger. So wisdom bringing safety is something that was in chapter 1. We see it again in chapter 2. Um, the fact that foolishness will destroy you is something you see in both chapters. Right back in chapter 1, verse 32, it said, For the turning away of the inexperienced will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. And then you get to this chapter, and it talks about the forbidden woman, and then afterwards it says this, verse 18, For her house sinks down to death, and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her. None reach the paths of life. So again, we see this like foolishness will ruin your life. And then um, in verses 13 and 15 of this chapter, we see it says, from, from those who abandon the right paths, and the word from is related to the verse before. It was saying wisdom will rescue you from. So wisdom will rescue you from those who abandon the right paths to walk in the ways of darkness, from those who enjoy doing evil and celebrate perversion, whose paths are crooked and whose ways are devious. Does it remind you of anybody from last week? You remember? 
The, who, what would we call them? They were the what? Yeah, the gang. The gang from last week. And the dad was saying, watch out for these people. They do bad things, and you don't want to walk in their paths. And again, we see that kind of thing here. Um, the difference this time, though, is a forbidden woman is added into the mix. Last week, it was all guys, right? Uh, well, I, don't, I guess we don't know for sure. Did it say guys? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it maybe, uh, should be equal opportunity. Gangs can be guys and women, I guess, all going around <laughs> slaughtering people. Um, but I pictured last week a group of guys, and this week I again pictured a group of guys, but then we got an added person, the forbidden woman, this time. And she'll come up again more throughout the book of Proverbs. So we see there are some similarities between chapter 2 of Proverbs and chapter 1. But there are also some differences, okay? And so I'll mostly focus on the differences. As I was reading through chapter 2 this week, the first thing that I noticed I, to me that stood out was that chapter, one's, uh, chapter 2 is quite a bit more positive than chapter 1. Chapter 1, it seemed to me the majority of the verses were fairly negative. Foolishness will destroy you. Watch out for these bad people. Uh, they set an ambush to kill themselves. They attack their own lives. All who profit dishonestly, it takes the lives of those who receive it. Even later on when wisdom is talking and she says, I in turn will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. Um, so it seemed to me that uh, last week the, 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 the emphasis of the chapter was very much on the negative, right? Which is why last week's sermon was titled, Foolishness Will Destroy You. There was a little bit of wisdom will protect you, but that wasn't really the main thing. The main thing was foolishness will destroy you. So I just went with the emphasis. This time I read through it and went, oh, it's the other way around. There's a little bit of foolishness will destroy you in this chapter, but there's a lot of like wisdom is good for you. I mean, just verses seven and eight, right after it says, you'll know this knowledge, you'll have this wisdom from God. It says, he stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity. So he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his loyal followers. And so we can see there's a lot more wisdom is positive rather than foolishness is negative in this chapter. Another thing that I noticed, and I, I think this is, this is a, a similarity and a difference. The similarity is in this chapter, wisdom is again connected with the fear of the Lord. Did you catch that? Wisdom is connected to fearing the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh. In the original Hebrew, that's the word. It's translated the Lord here in this passage. And so there's this connection between wisdom and fearing the Lord, and that's not new. It, the Proverbs, we're only at chapter 2 now, and it's already said it two other times. This is now the third time. Back in chapter 1, the first proverb was, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. And then later on, um, when the dad is talking to his son, and then he, uh, or however it goes, but it, wisdom begins speaking. Remember in verse 20 of last week, and wisdom says... Um, this is, you're not going to put up on screen, but it, wisdom talks about how they're not interested in my counsel, they rejected all my correction, and they didn't choose to fear the Lord. And so last week when wisdom was speaking, wisdom says, like it kind of equates rejecting wisdom with not fearing the Lord, not worshiping the true God. You reject wisdom and you're rejecting God. So we see that again in this chapter, but this time it's the dad who's saying it rather than wisdom. The dad is saying it to his son. And in fact, this whole chapter really is a speech that a father is giving to a son, and he uses a bunch of if-then statements. I don't know if you caught it. But he says if several times, and then he says then a couple of times. And so the idea is if you do this, then this will happen. And if you do this, then this will happen. And so if you look at the first if, we're going to look at the first if and the first then. You look at the first if, chapter 2, verse 1. It's my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you. Okay? That's the if. If you do that, if you listen to the wisdom that I am giving you, then what? And he goes on for a while with actually several more ifs, but he finally gets to the then in verse 5. So if you listen to my wisdom, what happens? Look at verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. The dad says, if you accept my wisdom, then you will understand the fear of the Lord because the Lord gives wisdom. It seems to me that what the dad is saying here is, son, if you listen to me and you pursue wisdom, okay, this wisdom that I'm giving you and this wisdom that you must pursue, it will lead you to Yahweh. It will lead you to the God of the Bible. So if you listen to my voice, then you will understand God and you will worship God, and that God who you worship will give you wisdom, right? I'm giving you wisdom to lead you to the Lord who will give you wisdom, and you'll be blessed. Now, what I want you to notice 
as, as, as you read that, as you see this father saying this to his son, I'm leading you to God who will lead you to wisdom. You need to notice that the dad is indoctrinating his son in the worship of the Lord. He's not just saying, my son, you need wisdom, so go out there and find it wherever you can, right? He says, you need to fear the Lord, right? You will understand the fear of the Lord. You will discover the knowledge of God, and then he's going to give you wisdom. The dad in this proverb is indoctrinating his son into the worship of the Lord, and he is teaching him that God is the source of wisdom. Now, once we realized that, I thought, okay, now what I'd like to do is I want to ask and answer this question. Should parents do that? Should parents indoctrinate their children? Because we live in a society where some people say no to that. Certainly you've heard this, right? That you should not. You should not. Don't push your religion on your children, and you don't need to be indoctrinating them and just let them kind of go their own way. Sometimes you'll see on social media people will say things like this. I don't teach my children what to think. I teach them how to think, right? Which is a cool little phrase. Like maybe that does apply to some context somewhere. But my answer to the question, should parents indoctrinate their children, is most certainly yes. This is real easy. Most certainly, parents should indoctrinate their children. Are you sure, Mario? Yes, I'm sure. We're studying the book of Proverbs. This is something you, I haven't said it in these exact words yet, but I really pretty much have. You already know this if you've been coming. Proverbs is a manual for the indoctrination of young people into God's wisdom. That's what it is. Like the book we're studying, they wrote, it was, this, this manual was made for these young Israelites so that they would be taught, they would be trained, they would be indoctrinated into the wisdom of the Lord. So there's no way we go, well, should I do that? Yes. The, uh, yes, God wants you to do that. There are books in the Bible for that purpose. Proverbs is in there for that purpose. And to be honest, even if you go, I don't know, listen, <laughs> you are going to indoctrinate your children, whether you do it on purpose or not. It's just something you'll do. We all do it. Everybody does it. You can, I do not believe you can stop yourself from doing it, okay? You ever, we are going to indoctrinate our children into what we believe. They're going to see. They're going to be taught by us. They're going to know what we value. We are going to guide them whether we do it on accident or on purpose. You can be... Um, I mean, just, just the, way, the stuff you say, like your kids hear the things you say. They see the things that you value, even if you're a parent that doesn't talk very much. Like, they'll see how you behave, and by the way you behave, they will see what you value, and that guides children. That's just something that happens if you live in the same house with someone for 18 years. I don't believe you can stop it from happening. You cannot help but indoctrinate your kids towards something, and so if you decide to not indoctrinate your child on a particular matter, what you need to know is you're still going to be indoctrinating them, but in a different way or in a different direction. Let me give you an illustration. This is Time Magazine, okay? An issue, the, one of the September issues of Time Magazine. Um, I will admit right now this is not a fountain of wisdom, um, but I subscribe to it anyway. I think maybe because I just don't have enough annoyance and frustration in my life, <laughs> and I just need to read things that upset me every week, I guess. So, it's not true. I think I canceled my subscription a long time ago. They just keep sending it, and I don't even understand it. Okay, anyway, this is from the September issue, okay? If you cannot see it from in the back, the title of this article that I'm going to read to you some excerpts from is, long title, this is the title, I didn't assign a gender to my kid. It's up to them to decide what identity fits them best, okay? That's the title of the article. I'm just going to read it to you a little bit from it. And this is the opening sentences. And this is written by um, the, the woman that had the child. Like, she was pregnant. Um, I don't know if she always likes it's she or not, but anyway, the person that wrote this ha was pregnant and had a child, and that's what it's about, so let me read. What are you having? I'd be standing in line at the post office or at a movie theater, and I'd realize a stranger was staring at my belly. The kind person thought they were asking me a simple question with a simple answer. Is it a boy or a girl? If you want to get technical, my partner Brent and I had found our child's found out our child's sex chromosomes in the early stages of my pregnancy, and we had seen their genitals during the anatomy scan. But we didn't think that information told us anything about our kid's gender. The only things we really knew about our baby is that they were human, breech, and going to be named Zoomer. <laughs> we weren't... Mm 
We weren't going to assign a gender or disclose their reproductive anatomy to people who didn't need to know, and we were going to use the gender-neutral personal pronouns they, them, and their. We imagined it could be years before our child would tell us in their own way if they were a boy, a girl, non-binary, or if another gender identity fit them best. Until then, we were committed to raising our child without the expectations or restrictions of the gender binary. Articles goes on and on. About halfway through. When people think of gender neutral, their minds often go to a grayish, beige, potato-hued color palette. But we don't dress Zoomer in burlap sacks or only give them toys the color of wheat thins. By the way, give them toys. So the them there is just one kid, though. We give them toys. Like we do not give them toys only the color of wheat thins. We give them options, and they thoughtfully pick what they like the most. For a while, Zoomer's favorite color was pink, then it was orange. They picked the pink, purple, and aqua bed sheets, the fire truck socks, the outer space sleeping bag, and the violet climbing shoes. Um, she goes on, and then these are the last sentences of the article. And it says, around their fourth birthday, Zoomer started declaring a gender identity and claiming some gendered pronouns. Brent and I are honoring Zoomer's identity and expressions and answering all their questions in an age-appropriate and inclusive way. I'm using they here because Zoomer is still exploring gender, and I want them to have some autonomy over how they share their identity with the world. I'm witnessing my child create their own gender. And who Zoomer has become is greater than anything I could have imagined or assigned. Instead of us telling the children who they should be, Maybe it's the children who will teach us how to be. We just have to get out of their way. Um, that's not what Scripture teaches. Um, it's against what Scripture teaches, it seems to me. Several things in there, I think. Um, there's a lot of things I could say. There's just two things I want to point out for now. One is the author of this article is very committed to non-binary gender theory. And she points out in the article that she continued to use they, them, and theirs even after Zoomer had chosen a gender identity and gendered pronouns. And they said the reason why um, was because they're still exploring gender, right? The child is four. And I want them to have some autonomy over how they share their identity with the world. Okay, here's the second thing I want you to understand, though. And this is, this is why I read you the article. I want you to understand this. <laughs> To not indoctrinate your child about something is to indoctrinate them in a different way. To say, and this is something that she talks about in the article, to say, well, I'm not going to indoctrinate my child with all of these ideas of boy and girl and traditional gender roles. That, to, the choice to do that is not to just do no indoctrination. The choice to do that is to teach your kid a different way of looking at it, a different thing, right? It's not, it's not like there's just no indoctrination. To say I'm not going to indoctrinate is to teach something different. Do you see what I'm saying here? And that's true about the way that we handle our children and, and, and the way that they would relate to God and his wisdom. That if, we, if you were to say with, my, with your children, if you were to say, you know what, I'm not going to like, take a strong stand on this because I don't want to push my religion on them, and so I'm going to just kind of whatever they come up with, you know, I'll say, you know, now dad, Christianity works for daddy, but you know, but you'll have to find your own way. And I'll kind of do this sort of raising my child where it's like, I, I won't tell him to go to church. I won't tell him to not go to church. You know, it'll just be whatever. I won't talk about it's important to believe in God. I won't say that it's not important. Like I'll just let them figure it out in their own way. What I'm letting you know is if you choose to do that, that is teaching them something about God. Because you will not be able to do that with everything. And so it is teaching them that whatever they decide about God or whatever they do with God and his wisdom is not important like the other things that you do take a position on, which, by the way, you will take a position on a thousand other things. You cannot have a, well, there's nothing that I have to say about this, about everything. You will not be able to do that. There will be 10,000 things that you talk to your kid about and say, this is the way it is. You can't help with that do that. You're going to have a pot on the stove one day, and it's got boiling water in it, and your kid's going to walk up toward it, and you're going to say, that's hot, don't touch it. You will not say, that's hot, maybe for you, or maybe cold. I don't want to make a definitive statement about this. Like, that's not what you're going to do. You're going to say, it's hot, you ought not touch it. You're going to do that with so many things. Your kids are going to do things, and you're going to say, you're doing it the wrong way. Okay, one of my kids was mowing the lawn incorrectly not too long ago. You know, some of you laugh, like, can you mow the lawn incorrectly? Yes, you can. <laughs> and I will explain how. 
had the lawnmower, it was a push lawnmower, pushed the lawnmower, did a swipe, okay, and he, he's young, so this is, I'm not like criticizing him, you, this, you gotta learn somehow, you gotta do it, there's certain things you gotta do wrong, and then your parents go, oh, that's the wrong way, so that's what he did, so he did a swipe with the lawnmower, and then turned around to go the other way, and did another swipe, but did not make sure that the wheel of the lawnmower was right on the edge of the cut grass, and so the second swipe caused there to be, you know what I'm talking about, a little median, <laughs> where there's this like one inch of tall grass in between the two swipes. And it kept happening, and so, I, and so obviously you have to go back and do a third swipe to get rid of the little middle patch, and so I said, hey, you need to, what you need to do is just make sure the wheel of the lawnmower is right on the mowed grass, and you do that each time, it's going to save you a bunch of time. It'll, it'll take you an extra hour to mow the lawn if you have to keep going back and doing a third swipe every time. Why did I do that? Because I'm his dad, and I care about him, I saw that he was doing it the wrong way, and it's my job to teach him things. And what I'm saying is, if you get to the point where you say, you're, you're living your life and you're doing what every parent does. Hey, this is the right way. This is the wrong way. Do this. Don't do that. Watch out for that. And then when it comes to God, you say, well, find your own path and I hope you do. And you know, that's going to teach your kid something about Jesus. It will teach your kid that Jesus doesn't matter. Jesus is not important like lawn mowing is, right? Because dad's got opinions about lawn mowing, but he, but he didn't have much when it came to whether I should be involved in my church or not. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to say. To, to, to say I'm not going to take a stand on that is certainly to take a stand on that. And so we teach our children by the way that we talk and the, the, the behavior that we model before them. And even if you are someone here who doesn't have any children, okay, you, just, you don't have kids, if you are someone who is a Christian and you disciple other Christians, you're in an accountability group or you're in somewhere ever, you're trying to help someone with their spiritual life. Like we need to realize that the Bible is not one of those, eh, everybody finds their own path. Proverbs chapter 2 is a speech from a father talking to his son saying, I am leading you to the fear of the Lord and that's where you will find wisdom. We need to notice that Proverbs is fatherly instruction about the fear of the Lord and the consequences are huge. When you look at chapter 2, the consequences of whether you go the right way or not, it's not like it's just, well, it doesn't really matter. If you look at verse, let's go with 11 and 12, discretion will watch over you and understanding will guard you. This is if you're one of the people who fears the Lord and has his wisdom, rescuing you from the way of evil. But if not, just skip down to verse 22. The chapter ends with these words, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous uprooted from it. This whole chapter is a giant if-then speech about accepting God's wisdom or not. That's important. All right, my next thing I'll point out to you, the third thing that's kind of different between this chapter and the chapter before it, I want you to notice in Proverbs chapter 2 that wisdom is to be pursued with effort. I would say especially in comparison to chapter 1. In chapter 1, it said, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. That's how it began. But this time, it's way more than that. It seems much more intense like the way that you get wisdom. It was listen to what your dad says, but look what it says this time. Proverbs 2, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, that's similar to last week, but this time he doesn't stop. He keeps going, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. And he doesn't stop there. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, and then he doesn't stop there. And if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, and then you finally get, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. You see what I'm saying? Chapter one, it was like, hey, listen to wisdom. Don't reject your mother's teaching. This time it's accept it, store it up, take it in internally, call out for it, ask for it, seek it, want it, treasure it. So there's more emphasis, it seems to me, in this chapter that, that wisdom is to be pursued with effort, and yet, in this same chapter, wisdom is given as a gift, right? Verse 6, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So you pursue it, and yet it is also given, and this is similar to other parts of the Bible, where the Bible says, you've got a job to do. This is your responsibility. Do the thing God's called you to do, and then if you do it and you are successful, you thank God because you didn't do it on your own. Another thing I want you to notice in this chapter is that wisdom is not simply about facts. This 
passage talks about the person who gets wisdom and then starts talking about that person being connected to God in like personal and spiritual ways. That it's not just, wisdom isn't just, if, if you pursue wisdom, you'll have a longer list of facts that you know. No, it's if you discover the knowledge of God and the Lord gives you wisdom. Let me just read it to you from uh, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And then look at what the next word is. It's not, and then you'll be smart. It's he stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity so that he may guard the paths of justice and protect the way of his loyal followers. That if the Lord gives you wisdom and you're one of his loyal followers, you, you don't just have wisdom. Somehow he's saying you have God looking out for you. Do you see the difference there? I, I get, in other words, wisdom is apparently not just something that is systemic, that it's like, do this and then this will happen. There's a personal spiritual aspect to it of God being in your life. I, the only way I, like the, the way I was thinking about it, illustrating this was, um, let's go back to the boiling pot of water over here, remember? Here it is. And so the, the water's boiling. And imagine someone says to you, um, if you heat the water to 212 degrees, it will boil, right? That's the way people would, would describe it. They would say, like, we know the boiling point of water is 212. So they would say, if you, boil, if you get the water up to 212 degrees, it will boil. Most people will not say, if you get the water up to 212 degrees, God will boil it. Correct? Right. You don't, you don't, you don't make it into a personal spiritual thing. It's just 212, it'll boil. But in this proverb, it's not just saying, hey, you look for wisdom and you'll find wisdom. No, it's when the Lord gives wisdom, he, right? It's, not just, it's, it's like he'll boil the water. He, he'll boil the water. He stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity, right? He protects the way of his loyal followers. And so we see is the way that Proverbs talks about Wisdom is there's some connection between being wise and fearing the Lord and being in relationship with the Lord where he's looking out for you. Also notice in verse 10, it says, wisdom will enter your mind and knowledge will delight your heart. And so apparently wisdom is an internal thing that changes you on the inside. It goes into you. Knowledge will delight your heart, which is kind of the opposite of the, the bad side of the proverb from chapter one. Remember in chapter one, it said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it said fools despise wisdom, right? Or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. So back in chapter one, we saw fools are, it's like, almost like the opposite of the word delight, right? Fools are, they, they despise wisdom. And in this chapter, we see that the people of God who fear him, they're delighted by this knowledge he gives them. And so I don't know for sure what this is talking about, but it seems to me there's something internal within you that, that your delights change as God's wisdom comes into your life, and that does fit with what I've experienced in my Christian life. That as I have like grown in my Christian life, it has been more than just an intellectual thing. Like When I look back over the past 10 or 20 years, and you were to say, hey, how have you grown in the Lord, Mario? I don't think my answer would be, I have so many more facts that I know about him. Right, 20 years ago, there were 400 facts I knew about God, and now I have 1,200 facts that I know about God. That that wouldn't be the way I would describe what has happened as I have matured. That, that in addition to knowing more things, and it is true, I do know more things about God than I did 20 years ago, but my desires also have changed. Like knowing God causes something in, the, the, what I delight in and what I despise changes. And so I, that's something that I've noticed even in my own life. And I'm not saying all of my sinful desires have been totally eradicated, because that's not true. I would say at least once a week, if not more often, I think something. And then after I think it, I think, whoa, that was terrible. Like, I can't believe I just thought that. That's embarrassing. I'm so glad I'm the only one that heard that. And so I'm saying that to say, I'm not saying all sinful desire has been eradicated as I have come to fear the Lord, but I am saying that it does seem to me that knowing God has changed my affections. There are things that delight me, and there are things that my, 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 my affections and my desires are different. I mean, just as an even small example, um, I haven't, I don't think I've watched a rated R movie in like 10 or 15 years. And I don't think it's because there was a day that I decided they were objectively wrong and then used a bunch of self-control to stop. I just don't want to see that anymore. 
And I'm not saying everything works that way because I don't think that is the case. I think there are, there are things, kind of like Bartow talked about earlier, that, that the, 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 my desire to do the right thing is there and the desire to do the wrong thing is there, and they're fighting it out, and I'm having to fight it out. But wisdom will enter your mind, and you fear the Lord, and what he gives you will delight your heart. He changes you on the inside. And then we'll end by just looking at the final two verses. The last two verses of Proverbs chapter 2 say this. For the upright will inherit, uh, inhabit the land, and those of integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous uprooted from it. I want to talk about the way that this proverb ends, uh, this chapter of Proverbs ends, and I want to talk about it in two ways. I want to talk about it, what I think it meant for the original readers, like when Proverbs was first published, what, did, what would they have gotten out of this? And then I also want to talk about what does this mean for us if we are people who are not even living in that land, okay? What, for those of us who are now living way later, in fact, we're living in a period where we understand Jesus and the gospel and the fact that he has died on the cross for our sins. And so, like, I want to talk about what did this mean for the people in the Old Testament when they first read it, but also when we look at it through New Testament eyes, how are we to take this? So let's start with the Old Testament first. I think that when they were just originally reading this, the idea here would have been for the upright, the word upright here would mean basically the people who are doing what the book of Proverbs says, right? The people who are following God's ways. They will what? They will inhabit the land. What land? Israel. That they would live in Israel in safety and security and things would go well for them in the land that they would remain in. So they're going to be good and they're going to live in God's good land. However, the wicked, the people who reject God's wisdom, they will be cut off from the land and uprooted from it. In what way? Either that they would be killed or that they would be banished from Israel. So that's what I think this meant at the time it was written. But I think that we need to look at this and go, now how does it apply to us? Because we can't just directly apply it to us, right? If I'm wise, I'll get to remain in Israel. You're not in Israel, right? And if I'm unwise, I will be banished from Israel. I mean, in many ways, we all, we all live in Ocala. We're already banished from Israel, right? We're already not experiencing this. So what does this mean for us when we look at it with New Testament eyes? And so this is what I would say, and I'll end the sermon with this. I believe verse uh, 21 is a picture of Jesus, specifically the word upright. For the upright will inherit the land. Who is the one who is upright? It's Jesus. Now, at the time this was written, I don't think that's what they were thinking about. I think they were just saying, hey, if you just do all the stuff in Proverbs and you follow the law of God, right? But what we find if you keep reading the Bible is nobody does that. Nobody's ever done that. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot about that because we covered it last week. Do you remember that last week? Everybody's a sinner. There are no upright people. We already covered this when we talked about chapter one. So they're saying, yeah, if you're upright, you'll inhabit the land. And I guess Israel learned the hard way. Nobody's upright. Nobody gets to hang on to the land for long. Everybody's wicked. The only person in all of scripture who's upright is Jesus. And so I think when we look at this through New Testament eyes, we've got to realize like, okay, this, Jesus is the only one worthy of inhabiting the land and having the integrity to remain in God's land. And if we want to be the people who inhabit the land, it's not going to be purely me trying to follow every proverb. I need to be in the upright one. I need to be united to Christ. I need to be in his group, one of the people that he forgives and declares to be upright. And then I will inhabit the land. What land? Israel? No, I don't think that's the land that's been promised to us as Christians who believe in Jesus. What have we been promised? Very quickly, I will read to you from Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore Jesus also suffered outside the gate. This is referring to when he died on the cross for our sins. He suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Make them upright. And then look at how it ends. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace, right? That is the times when we follow Jesus and we won't be popular. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. And so going back to Proverbs chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. As we read it through the New Testament lens of the gospel, I think we know this. We are to follow what the Father in this chapter has said, but we need to realize Jesus is the only upright one who truly can inhabit the land. We must be in him. And the land for us is the enduring city to come. He is the one who has earned the right to live forever in the enduring city to come, and we want to be a part of that. 
and then the second half should be even more obvious to you now. And to be cut off from the land and the treacherous to be uprooted from it is not saying that if you are foolish in this life, you will be banished from Israel. This is talking about judgment, and we know from the New Testament what that is, right? It's talking about hell, like God's judgment, being uprooted from, not living with God forever in his enduring city. So to summarize what we learned today, here we go. Proverbs chapter 2, similar to Proverbs chapter 1, there's some differences. Seems to have more positive verses than negative. Wisdom is again connected to the fear of the Lord, but it's the father who says it and he teaches it to his son. Wisdom is to be pursued with effort, and yet it is also given by the Lord. Wisdom is not just facts, but it connects us to a personal God. And then we end with the fact that there, is, there, are, there are consequences to whether we are in the upright one, whether we are these people who accept the commands and are led to the fear of the Lord, or whether we are the people who are uprooted and judged. So that's Proverbs chapter 2. Thank you for listening. Let's close in prayer. God, I do thank you for this book. I do feel like, um, I don't know, I believe that teaching through books like this forces me to say things I wouldn't otherwise say. And I, I love the idea that we just will, will learn your word and, and let it take us where it takes us. And, and I pray that we would, as individual Christians, live that way, that we would go, well, if God's word is a, is a river, I want it to take me wherever it is he he wants to take me, and I don't want to fight against it. So I pray you would make us people who, who fear you in a good way, who worship you, who revere you. So we would be in your son, Jesus, and live with you forever. We ask you to rescue you, rescue us from our evil ways, that you would deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.